Let me talk about the status of shrimp farming, where we've been, and where we're going. First of all, just a quick note about the history of shrimp farming. It has been all about disease, disease epidemics. And really, I show it in two lines because there's been a separate path of evolution in the Eastern Hemisphere versus the Western Hemisphere. And then you can see the bars for the white spot outbreak that hit in the 1990s, and then the EMS and EHP outbreaks that have hit around the year 2010, 2000, well, they're actually still ongoing until now. If we look at the global production of shrimp, you can see that the very first bar, it really marks, that's the year 2000, that marks the end of the white spot epidemic, a 10-year epidemic around the world. And then that marks the point when SPF vaname was introduced into Asia and it displaced infected monodon and the business took off. And we have here as one of the speakers, Jim Wyban. He's credited with introducing those SPF animals into Asia. As a result, shrimp production globally quadrupled in 10 years. But then we hit this other epidemic of EMS and EHP beginning around 2010. You can see the dip in the bar chart, but we are now emerging from that. And the projections from the goal meeting that was in Guayaquil in October of last year, the projections are that we can expect global shrimp production to increase about 6% a year for the next three years. This is because many countries are seeing growth. India, of course, Ecuador, Indonesia, Brazil, Mexico, Vietnam. And so the question becomes, what happens to all those shrimp and what's going to happen to shrimp prices? I'm going to get to that a little later in the discussion. So what do we need going forward? In my view, we need four things. We need more and more control. Control of disease, control of environmental impact, control of social issues. All the controls increase over time. We need more efficiency. We need to get better at producing more with less. We need marketing, how to increase shrimp consumption, and we need the trust of the consumer. And this involves third-party certification, like the best aquaculture practices. So let's take it step by step. Really, we have to innovate across the whole supply chain. It begins with breeding, then hatchery, nutrition, grow out, processing, and marketing. The whole process needs innovation. I love this um, slide about genetic improvement because it shows the, the rock star of breeding, animal breeding, which is the chicken. Since 1940, the chicken now grows almost 400% faster. And then if we look at beef cattle, much less. Swine, intermediate. And then we start to look at salmon, tilapia, and shrimp. And you can see these three aquaculture species have a trajectory that's overtaking chicken. And the reason, we're told, is that these species produce a lot more offspring per cycle. They have a much shorter generation period and they've only recently come from the wild. 
So the key point is that breeding is an enormous driver. It has the potential to increase performance 10 or 15 percent per generation. And there's nothing we can do in any other field of the, any other portion of the value chain, like feed, like hatchery, like processing, that can give us those kind of consistent annual gains. So breeding is a huge driver. Now, I mentioned earlier that shrimp farming in Asia took off in the year 2000 with the introduction of SPF shrimp, shrimp that are free of a list of specified pathogens. And you can see here that the list keeps getting longer and longer. But we also hear that some countries are having great success with specific pathogen resistance. In other words, they don't really worry too much about what diseases infect the shrimp. They just try to breed shrimp that are resistant to those diseases. So which one is best, SPF or SPR? My observation is that the two are converging. The SPF programs are becoming more and more SPR, and the SPR programs are becoming more and more SPF. So in other words, the best alternative is an SPF shrimp. It's free of pathogens but it is also resistant or tolerant of diseases. Now, there are many things that one could breed for, but the typical ones are growth, faster growth, resistance to multiple pathogens. So these days, every farmer wants resistance to white spot, EMS, and perhaps EHP. But in certain areas, other diseases are also important, like NHP or IMNV. So multi-pathogen disease resistance is very important, and it can be included in a breeding program. Also, there's reproductive performance. Years ago, Vaname would only produce 100,000 nauplii per spawn. Today, it's not unusual to have Vaname produce 400,000 per spawn. And then dietary requirements. So it's also possible to breed the shrimp for tolerance of high levels of soybean meal in the diet. When we look at the performance of farms, we actually in Kona Bay, we consider two different things. One in the green bars is what is the typical performance of all the customers in a given area. For example, on the left, what's the typical feed conversion? And on the right, what is the typical harvest size? Or you could also look at it as the growth rate, the average daily gain. And but then we also consider what's happening with the top 20% of the, of the producers. This is a better look at what is the genetic potential of the animals. So the key lesson here is that a good farmer can get far better performance, both in FCR, growth rate, and final size than the average production. So genetics is only part of the solution. Management is also a very big part. Now in the area of hatchery and nursery, I'm not sure how many hatchery companies we have here, but there's lots of room for innovation. There's still a high reliance on natural foods like polychaete worms, but we know a lot of the polychaetes are harvested from the wild. They carry disease. It's a perfect way to infect the broodstock. So we need better diets. We need eventually dry diets that completely replace the natural foods. And the same is true for Artemia. And then we look at the nurseries. 
And these are the, the systems where we stock the post larvae and raise them for a, a week or a few weeks to produce a more robust animal that goes into the ponds to yield a shorter cycle and more, cy more cycles per year and larger size animals. What I'd like to draw your attention to is the salmon business. This nursery system, shown on the right, is a salmon farming nursery. Now in the salmon world, especially in Norway, the government of Norway has said there will be no more licenses to increase salmon farming because of the challenge with sea lice, a parasite. Yet there's a tremendous demand for salmon. So what the industry is doing is putting in many, many land-based salmon farms that are recirculating systems to produce larger and larger smolts to go in the cages. So the nursery systems for salmon are absolutely taking off. And this is a model of something we could do in shrimp farming. In the feeds area, also tremendous innovation. How to substitute for fish meal so that the, the limited supply of fish meal can be extended. As aquaculture grows, we have to use less and less fish meal because there simply isn't enough. And there, there's great progress, single cell proteins, insect proteins, wood byproducts. In the picture, you see seaweeds. There are even projects of growing seaweed in the open ocean, digesting it with enzymes and using it as a feed ingredient. And there's also great progress on the oils, how to replace fish oil. Today, the main source is algal oils, the only ones that have the highly unsaturated fatty acids. But coming soon are the genetically modified land-based oils, these plants that instead of producing, for example, camelina oil, the genes from algae have been put into the camelina plant, and it will now produce the same oils as algae, but much cheaper. And the same is true for canola. So we will have solutions for fish meal and oil. On the grow out side, the evolution of shrimp farming is a continuous movement toward more and more control. Over time, more and more control. It's not a question of periodically having a great crop because you were lucky to have the right weather, the right conditions, your neighbor didn't affect you. The goal is to be consistent and to put in the controls so that every single cycle you can have predictable results. Let me mention Ecuador because Ecuador and India compete largely in, a, in the same market with large size shrimp. Both countries are growing fast. In Ecuador, we see their traditional ponds, which have a stocking density that's quite low, 10 to 12 per square meter. You see the FCR is only 1.8 to 2. But then you look at the more advanced farms in Ecuador, and you can see they are getting double, or more than double, production. Instead of 3.4 tons per year, six to eight tons per year. And the feed conversion down to 1.2 to 1.4. This allows the Ecuadorians to say, wow, if we can convert all our farms to this system, Ecuador can double its production. So we need to look at India. What are we doing in India to increase productivity and efficiency? One of the ways Ecuador is doing it is with automatic feeders. And of course, they're very common in Asia. But some of the feeders in Ecuador have the acoustic system, which is a yet a further enhancement on the auto feeders. I'm really impressed with the shrimp toilet. I believe my friend Robbins McIntosh coined that elegant name for the trap that removes the organic waste from shrimp ponds. That not only improves the water quality, but in that organic waste is where the bacteria and the parasites tend to accumulate. 
So by removing that, it reduces the impact of EMS and EHP. Another exciting development is, is the introduction of covers on shrimp ponds. So here's a large farm in Peru that not only has plastic liners on the bottom of the pond, but plastic covers on top. This helps control the temperature. It's a little cooler in Peru. They can produce year-round, but it also controls diseases, controls the algae blooms. And their experience, and they presented this at the last goal meeting, it takes 10 times the investment to build the kind of ponds they have versus the standard Ecuadorian pond, but they get 20 times more production. So instead of getting five tons per hectare, they get 100 tons per hectare. They have both kinds of ponds in their farm, but they think the intensive is the way to go. On processing, one of the areas that really needs attention, it's the area that probably requires the most labor of any aspect of shrimp farming, and it's the one that moves shrimp farming into the lowest labor cost countries. It's really a limiting factor. We now see there are automatic peelers that have been developed, machine vision grading systems. So this whole aspect of relying on labor is going to change. We have more sophisticated techniques coming. And then on the traceability, you'll hear more and more about blockchain traceability. This is a, a way to track in an immutable way. It cannot be changed. Sort of like adding trains to a rail car every time the product moves through the value chain. And it, once it gets to the end, it can be instantly tracked back to the beginning. The shrimp trade has changed a lot. Here's a map of what it was in the year 2012, thanks to Rabobank. And you can see that India in 2012 was shipping some to Europe and maybe the bulk to the US, but Thailand was the major supplier to the US. Now we fast forward to present, and you can see India is shipping larger quantity to the US and more to China and Vietnam. And you can see Ecuador, a major product flow going to China. Also see Indonesia showing up as a major supplier to the US. When we look at the value of exports of shrimp around the world, we can see that in the six years of, since 2012 to 2017, the value of shrimp exported has risen from about 14, 000, or excuse me, $14 billion to $22 billion. It's an enormous, enormous increase, over $1 billion per year in value. But if you look at the light blue bar, that's China. Most of the increase in demand is attributed to China. The largest importer is the US, seen on the bottom, the dark blue. But is China going to eclipse the US? It, these are the main, the main drivers in the export market. Now, the big problem we're having right now that I mentioned earlier in my earlier talk is shrimp prices. If you look on the graph on the left, you see tremendous volatility of that blue line, shrimp prices are up and down, versus chickens, broilers, very stable. And if you look at the graph on the right, you see the shrimp prices for the year 2016 and 17, the upper lines, and then that red lower line is 2018. So as the shrimp industry began to recover from EMS, early last year, supplies increased, prices bottomed out, and we're now operating near historic low prices of shrimp around the world. And most shrimp farmers are focused just on production. Outsiders ask us, what are you doing about marketing? It's a fragmented business, we compete with each other, 
we're not very good at sharing data, the market doesn't really understand our productivity, and this system is not going to work going forward. Now, one model that we're very excited about is the avocado business. The avocado formerly was considered a fruit that had fats that were bad for you. You shouldn't eat too much. It's bad for your cholesterol, it's bad for your heart, and the avocado quality was poor. Then the avocado producers got together and they formed a marketing board and they have tripled per capita consumption of avocados in the United States at the same time that prices have increased. And they also share their data. You can go on the Avocado Marketing Board website and you can see the weekly actual exports to the U.S. market by each country. And this is audited by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And it's a part of a mandatory checkoff program that really works. This is the kind of thing we need if we're looking to the future. What point is it to increase production if we can't also increase consumption? So at the goal meeting last October, a group of people got together and said, let's work on shrimp marketing. They formed an organizing committee. They met in Chicago in December. They met again last week at the Global Seafood Marketing Conference in San Diego. And there's a plan developing to improve shrimp marketing. And I'd invite any of you that want to be part of this, please speak to me. And we'll meet again in Boston at the Seafood Show in March. Now, the final element to marketing is having the trust of the consumer. If we don't have trust, there's no way we can sell more shrimp. We can't increase consumption. This means we have to have a third party verify that we're doing it properly. Environmental, social, food safety, traceability. One of the programs that offers certification comes from the Global Aquaculture Alliance. It's called Best Aquaculture Practices. It's benchmarked to those three international benchmarks on the left for food safety, environmental, and social. It's backed by many, many endorsers around the world. These endorsers, these buyers, major companies, say for example Walmart, they establish sustainability goals. They say we want all of our seafood to be certified by the year X. Usually that's the year 2000 to 2025. And then they expect their suppliers to get on board. I'm really happy that BAP has been uh, wonderfully supported in India. Here you see the growth of the BAP certification program. It's growing about 30% a year. And India is the largest supporter in the shrimp farming world. But BAP includes salmon and tilapia and many other species. So let me conclude by saying that innovation is needed if we're to grow innovation throughout the whole supply chain. Breeding is an especially, especially important area. And we have to build transparency and trust, and we have to work together on marketing. Some challenges are just too big for any of us to take on by ourselves. We have to work together, not just India, but the entire shrimp farming world has to work together on shrimp marketing. And let me conclude by saying I hope you'll join us for the Goal meeting. It's going to come to Chennai, first time that Goal has come to India. It will be here in October 21 to 24, right here in Chennai. Thank you very much.